Today I'm going to be presenting some work that we did on long-term anomaly detection at Twitter. And uh, to give some background sort of on the project, this was actually a second part of uh, an earlier project we did where we wanted to identify anomalies in our core drivers and sort of application metrics. And there was a lot of work that we looked at uh, and tried to just kind of use something and apply it, but we were having problems detecting all of the anomalies. It's pretty trivial to find maximum anomalies, but we were having difficulty finding the anomalies in sort of the troughs of the, of the daily seasonality, so that those would sort of get hidden. Uh, so the big ideas from this original kind of project was that we were going to do some sort of time series decomposition to remove the seasonality. Uh, and then there's something which I'll bring up here in a minute that caused further problems. Uh, and then we made an assumption which uh, allowed us to then do sort of ESD on the remaining data, the remainder, and identify anomalies, both maximum anomalies and things that would be hidden sort of in the troughs of the day. So this image here shows basically just a, an anomalous piece of data and uh, our initial decomposition used uh, STL, uh, which essentially pulls it apart into three different sections and uses LOIS uh, by kind of combining like every hour of the day together and then you try and smooth that. And through this sort of iterative process, you can derive the seasonality very nicely, but the trend tended to chase the anomaly. So if you had a large anomaly, which is what we wanted to detect, then the trend would end up chasing the anomaly. And in the end, we would get these phantom anomalies, which you can see in that last little square. And so we were getting a lot of false positives from this. So then we were kind of talking about it, and we decided to make the assumption that when you're looking at a small enough window, you can make an assumption that there's a, sort of a baseline for this service, that the, you should be operating kind of at the same level, and if something deviates significantly, that that usually indicates an anomaly. And so we don't want to track that. That's not really part of the trend that we're interested in. So we ended up using the median instead of these derived trends to represent sort of a standard use line. Uh, and once we had that, we were getting these remainders back that it made it really easy to tag the uh, anomalies. So this is some examples of that original system. We would take a two-week window, which allowed us to get every day of the week two examples of them. So there's sort of a weekly seasonality and a daily seasonality in the data. Uh, and here as well, this one's obviously is the beginning of uh, kind of like a breakout. And for some other metrics that are, are a little noisier. Um, but we were able to detect both these large uh, anomalies as well as sometimes things that were just little blips during the day that indicated different usage behavior on certain applications. So uh, once we started talking about this with other teams, they expressed an interest in doing historical anomaly detection where they wanted to say, let's look at a year's worth of data and just you know, tag all of the anomalies. We got the timestamps for all of those anomalies, what they should have been if they were normal for that time of day. Uh, but it became problematic in that our idea about using the median to represent a sort of baseline for that service doesn't really work very well over a year. So over a year, there's clearly a trend, and we want to, uh, we want to be able to track that trend, and just putting a straight line over it is not super effective. Um, so we needed to find a way to track the trend within the data, but still provide us with a sort of baseline where this represents normal behavior. So we went back to the drawing board and said, you know, we want anomalies, uh, and we wanted to make sure it's fast. We want to get uh, for the long time series. Can we use other things for the trend in this larger time scale? So we went back and used basic STL, uh, the way it does its decomposition, tried to use the trend from that. Uh, we also looked at quantile regression to sort of hone in on some sort of trend using B-spline uh, or something simpler. And, uh, and we got some varying results. So here we can kind of see this is sort of all of the trends for a whole year's worth of data overlaid on top of each other. Uh, the STL would chase the, as it did earlier, it chased the, the data really closely and so it wasn't actually a good indicator of kind of your average day-to-day -day use. Um, obviously using something like a linear regression doesn't fit very well either. 
uh, B spline fit very nicely. And so we started to look at that, but there was some challenges using the, the quantile regression with a B spline fit. Uh, and then we came up with a different solution. So uh, just one of the, the issues with the B spline was that uh, even though it did work really well for uh, a year, when we went back to our, our smaller windows and we were like, okay, so we can use this for the year long, but back to what we were doing, is there like a one solution for both time scales? What we found was that the B spline tended to chase the anomalies in smaller time scales as well. So although it was a decent solution for larger time scales, it didn't work for the one we had solved for earlier. So it wasn't like a one size fits all solution. Um, this led to a lot of false positives and things that were not anomalous, uh, which you can kind of see where it says B spline false positives. That is sort of normal usage, uh, but it's trapped in the middle of this big anomalous clump. And so those would actually be falsely tagged as anomalies as well when it was chasing it like that. Sorry, if I'm going really fast, by the way, I, I took an early flight and had a lot of coffee, so I'm trying to pace myself. So. Um, here you can see this is an extreme example of the B spline chasing the data as well. So we wanted to do better than this. We wanted one solution that could be used in both time scales. And we wanted this idea, we like this idea that if we're trying to tag anomalies, there should be this concept of like a normal usage level for the service. And we wanted it to be fast. So what we decided to do was apply our approach of decomposing two week chunks and using the median to represent uh, like your average use and then just kind of move that along in, in the hop size, sort of like a windowed approach. Uh, the nice thing about this is it's simple. Uh, when you're loading the data, you're really only ever analyzing two week chunks. So there's not really like a memory problem, uh, which is something that I'll talk about with the vSpline. Uh, and it was really consistent and worked very well. So this represents basically uh, the piecewise approach that I just described where we take our two week approach and just kind of roll it out over a much longer window. And the nice thing about it additionally is that, uh, it, it, like I said, it's simple, it's fast, we can roll it out over it and we also can put in some statistical confidence with the uh, ESD approach where it's quite aggressive here but we, we could back off by saying we want to absolutely be sure, you know, with a little more confidence. So we ran it for the STL trend, we ran it for the B spline, and these are just overlaps on actual production data. And what we found, which is interesting, is um, they do find similar anomalies, but the uh, piecewise tends to be more aggressive than the B spline in actual production data. But without us going through and tagging a year's worth of anomalies, which is not realistic. This wasn't a good indication of actually how it was performing. We just know that there's differences in how it looks at the production data. Um, additionally, the other thing that motivated us to pursue this piecewise approach for the long term is that it took three times as long to process the B-spline. It essentially had to load the entire year's worth of data and go over it. And we were finding uh, that when we did the piecewise, this the speed up was, was very significant. So we needed a way to see what it really was tracking and if we had a controlled test, how well does it perform, what does it miss? So we just did a very simple injection where we smoothed production data so that we had something that was representative of the data we were actually trying to use. And then we used uh, randomly injected anomalies that were of the size that we were seeing and what we were interested in looking for. And when we ran that, we found that STL was a disaster, as it chased it as you would expect. Um, but quantile, B-spline, and piecewise were, were pretty similar. So when the data was really smooth and there's no, you know, it's really easy to peg the anomalies, there is very little difference between the two. Um, however, the, like I said, the speed difference between doing piecewise versus the B-spline was, was quite significant. So, B-spline and piecewise are comparable, except for the speed, uh, or the, the difference in the, the speed uh, runtime. Basically, the, the 
they find similar anomalies in the controlled situation, but in actual production data, we found that the piecewise would pick up some interesting things that B spline might miss. The other interesting thing with the B spline is how smooth the trend in is uh, trend fits is a function of how large the data is. So if you're only interested in a month, the B spline will fit slightly different than if you're interested in two years worth of data. Whereas the piecewise has a nice consistent fit for the trend, regardless of how long you're looking at. Um, one thing that we did find that was interesting was the piecewise uh, was sensitive to the phase where we started within the week. So essentially in, in Twitter there's daily seasonality, but we also exhibit weekly seasonality. And if we started in the middle of the weekend, over a two week period we only captured one full weekend, and that would significantly affect the anomalies that it found. So we, we found that we wanted to kind of back so that we got two complete weekends uh, in, the, in the window, and that actually worked very nicely. So um, I think I sped through that pretty quickly. But that was our work. Uh, and we uh, implemented that and rolled it out for, for the team, and it's currently being used. Um, we're going to open it up for questions now. If you guys have um, some, I'm going to kick it off with one on how you actually um, use this technique internally and maybe uh, a little bit on the types of um, uh, anomalies that you injected to actually simulate the real world. Sure. Um, so the f to answer the first part of the question, uh, we have different teams that we're interested in it. So this research was uh, motivated by a second team coming and asking. And so what we've done is... Um, some teams are only interested in the maximum peaks, those that break the daily seasonality. Uh, and so we have a, a sort of a, a threshold that we set with them for that service. Whereas other teams were interested in sort of usage um, behavior. And so what we would do is actually put the threshold on the remainder component without the seasonality. So then they're alerted uh, whenever there's an anomaly, whether it's in a trough or at a peak moment. And the, the way it works is we send out a daily email to each team using the service, uh, using the, the thresholds basically. And we tag a list of all the anomalies with timestamps and the values that they should have been at and what they were at. Uh, and so that each team gets notified. Uh, as far as how we injected the anomalies, we uh, took a look at our two week window and the average size of the anomalies and then, and the average duration and then we randomly injected uh, with slight variations those types of anomalies into smooth data over, uh, and one per day, so no more than one, so that we could be. Hmm. Uh, William Colhane, Purdue University. So it sounds like what you did is you took a time window, found the median for that window, and used that median to find anomalies in that window, correct? Mm -hmm. Did you consider something like a weighted moving average that would follow the trends and kind of give you a median for that time window that was also based on previous windows so the anomalies in that window didn't affect their own analysis. Yeah, we, we actually started looking at trying to do some smoothing trends. Um, initially, what brought us to do the median was uh, we initially tried to smooth the data out and then that led us to, it was just the seasonality was so heavy, it led us to do the decomposition and then the decomposition, when it was done, it, we just found that substituting the median represented the, the uh, I guess, the average use. Like that, that represented like the stable state for the, for that metric. Um, and since it was a nice, simple solution, we we ended up substituting that instead of continuing to smooth further with the decomposition. I guess. I guess. Does that answer the? Uh, yes, it does. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Hi, Pradeep Padala, VM from VMware. Uh, it looks like you have taken your data, smoothed it out, and then injected uh, uh, anomalies randomly. Uh, did, did you consider doing anomalies in the, in the environment itself, like where you are collecting the data? Like in the actual production data itself? Yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, the, the smooth data was from the production data, um, so I, our thinking was, to try. Oh, so I mean, you're going even mm. back into like where you collect the data. Mm. Uh, so if let's say if this is the average utilization of a cluster, 
uh, and instead of that, go to the host and then inject uh, an anomaly there, like a higher uh, higher CPU utilization, let's say. Oh, okay, and see how it sort of propagates into the mm -hmm. actual data. Yeah. yeah, that would be actually a really useful test. We, we haven't run that one, but it would be good to do that. One of the hopes with this was um, we were hoping since it, it can timestamp the data across many metrics and it's automated that uh, sometimes these things ripple through many services and right. we were hoping to correlate the anomalies across the services to show how there might be relationships or okay so. okay thank you so john rashid again from vmware um when you actually complete doing this uh, type of um, uh, analytics here what are the things that you have influenced as far as changes how does this actually apply back to the production uh, environment and what are some of the changes that you know maybe we might experience from 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 what you're doing so um, the motivation for the original work was in sort of capacity planning to hopefully get a feel for uh, when a service that, you know, the plan may be getting out of line, uh, automated warnings. Um, there's also research that goes along with this where we were looking at breakouts and those sorts of things uh, to create a whole set of tools for monitoring uh, basically capacity planning. But as we were developing it, uh, other teams became interested in also how, like I was saying, if some anomaly comes in and how that ripples through the mm -hmm. services, which services were touched by the anomalies, mm -hmm. and if we can find relationships or correlations between them based off the anomalies, basically. So. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>